Hello and welcome to all of you. You're watching France 24's Tech Show. I'm Julia Seeger. In this edition, it may sound like a joke, but the kilogram is believed to have lost weight. Defined after a metal cylinder kept here in Paris, scientists have now decided to change the rules and peg it on nature's constant rather than on a physical object. The goal is to make it even more accurate. Plus, no docking, no hassle. In Test 24, we tell you more about the booming industry of dockless bike sharing. Humanity has to heal itself to ensure that its creations remain healthy. Those are the wise words of a robot version of Professor Einstein that took to the stage of this year's Web Summit in Lisbon. It was accompanied by another robot you may have heard of, also created by the company Hansen Robotics. Its name is Sophia, an AI bot modeled after Audrey Hepburn, who was just granted citizenship in Saudi Arabia. Well, our Tech24 team was at the summit this year and spoke to the AI firm's chief scientist. Ben Gordzell is also the founder and CEO of SingularityNet, a blockchain-based AI marketplace. Let's take a listen to what he thinks of the Saudi government's latest move. It would seem to me that Saudi Arabia's granting citizenship to our robot is part of a general movement their leaders are making to try to transform their economy into more of a tech economy away from reliance on fossil fuels and, and moving in a direction of, of greater human rights. I mean, for example, they're going to give women the right to drive, which by Western standards should have been the case all along. So it seems to be part of what I personally view as, as a bunch of positive moves by, by that government. But again, I would have been happy if essentially any government in the world had granted our robot citizenship because it's, it opens up the debate on robots being citizens, which, which I think is, is, is a positive thing. And you know, one thing I'm very interested in and which lies behind my work on the Singularity Net project as well as in Hansen Robotics, I'm interested in making the development of AI become international and decentralized so it's not owned by any one government and not owned by any multinational corporation. I want AI to be owned like by all the people of the world to accept contributions from everyone in the world and to provide benefit to everyone in the world. I mean that's why we're developing an open market for AI based on, on blockchain with the Singularity Net technology. And that's why we'd we would like our humanoid robots, including Sophia, to really be citizens of the world. I would like every country in the world to, to make her a citizen. If Saudi Arabia is the country that had the vision to start, then, I mean, more power to them for that. But they're not going to be the last country to make our robots a citizen. I'm sure of that. And to understand and apprehend the world around us, men created measurements. From meters to ampers and seconds, they were all defined using arbitrary terms and methods. And for the last 125 years, a small cylinder weighing exactly one kilogram and kept in a vault here in Paris served as the definition of the kilogram. But today, the General Conference on Weights and Measures has decided to redefine some of these basic units of measurements. Our very own Dan and Jay Cattlecar tells us why in this upcoming report. Located in the International Bureau of Weights and Measures facility in Sèvres, just outside Paris, is the one kilogram standard, a 39 millimeter tall cylinder made out of platinum and iridium. This physical artifact has been used to measure all other kilograms since 1889. This is a replica of uh, a national prototype kilogram and accessories that were supplied to uh, countries by the uh, BIPM. The kilogram standard is stored two floors underground in a high security vault that requires three keys. And one reason to do this is that this object is unique, so everyone has agreed that its mass is one kilogram. But it could be damaged, lost, stolen. The cylinder has reportedly lost weight ever so slightly to the tune of 45 micrograms. To get around this inconvenience, the kilogram will now no longer be represented by an object. It will join other SI units, such as the meter and the second, to be defined by constants in nature. The kilogram will now be defined by Planck's constant, which is named after the German scientist Max Planck. In Paris, scientists at the Kastler Brossel Laboratory have been conducting complex experiments to assist in the accurate calculation of this constant. In this experiment, we produced a cloud of code atoms using lasers. And then 
we use a laser on the vertical axis to accelerate the atoms, to transfer them a lot of what is called the recoil velocity. And then we can measure this recoil velocity. And from this recoil velocity, we are able to deduce a constant that is used for the adjustment of the fundamental constant. These experiments are part of a worldwide endeavor. Combining the results with those of other teams will help calculate more accurate and reliable definitions of the kilogram and other SI units, which are expected to be adopted by the end of next year. And it's time to welcome our in-house expert, Dan and Jay Cattlecar. Thank you so much for that report. You must have been a little disappointed not to get inside this vault and see the big K for yourself. Well, forget about getting inside the vault. I didn't even know under which building is this vault placed. It is so secret and this information is, is not disclosed. Very well, but maybe the, the replica is good enough. Um, so in this report, you say that Planck's constant uh, will be used to uh, redefine the kilogram. Why Planck's constant in particular? Well, the kilogram has hogged all the limelight. Uh, it's going to be redefined by the end of next year, but there are other SI units such as Ampere that will also undergo a redefinition. And one of the reasons why Planck's constant has been chosen is because it is linked to both mass and electrical charge. So once you derive an accurate value of Planck's constant, it is able to get uh, or to have a, an accurate definition of uh, different SI units. So that's why it was chosen. And just to tell you briefly, Planck's constant, essentially it links uh, the energy of a photon to its frequency. There's this famous energy equation called E is equal to h mu, which is at the heart of quantum mechanics. We also know the other famous energy equation by Einstein, E is equal to mc square. So that, right. that's where Planck's constant comes from. And so what I don't understand is how are scientists really measuring and determining the accurate value of Planck's constant? Well, there are two methods. One is the direct method. Uh, this is done by using something called Watt balance or Kibble balance. So what they do is, as you can see here, the, the mass is directly placed on this balance. And that mass is countered by an electric uh, force, which is uh, generated by electric current and voltage. And once you know the electric force, it is, a, it is possible to deduce Planck's constant using some mathematical formulae. So that is one of the methods. The second method is an indirect method. Uh, this is done by using a sphere of silicon. So scientists created this perfectly round uh, sphere of pure silicon 28. Now the idea was to count the number of atoms in that sphere and then to determine the mass of one atom. Now once you have that mass of one atom, it is possible to deduce an accurate value of Planck's constant by uh, getting a ratio of Planck's constant to this mass of one atom. This is done by experiments such as the one in kessler brossel lab, which uh, essentially uh, measure this ratio. And this contributes to the accurate uh, uh, deduction of Planck's constant. Now also, some SI units that we use on a daily day basis uh, are already being defined by nature's constants. Which are they? Well, first of all, meter. Uh, meter earlier, its definition used to be this uh, uh, platinum iridium bar, the same uh, substance that's used to make the, the cylinder that defines kilogram. And that was also placed in the same facility in SEV. That used to be the definition. But then we moved from this physical artifact to the speed of light. So now meter is defined according to the speed of light. So that is the length, of, uh, the length covered by light in certain amount of time. And the other definition is about the second. Uh, so second used to be first defined according to the rotation of the Earth but now it's defined according to the oscillations of the CCM-133 atom. And these oscillations, they, they are, the number is very high. So the number of oscillations or the time elapsed for this number of oscillations is now one second. Dan and Jay Cattlecar there, thank you so much. We're going to move on now to test 24. Dockless bike sharing is booming in cities worldwide. The most popular is probably still the Chinese company Mobike. Their bicycles have popped up on the sidewalks of cities across Asia, but also recently in Washington, D.C. and Manchester. Here in France, several startups are also betting on this growing industry, like pony bikes. It's like riding a pony. That's right, Julia. And it so happens today I had such a harrowing time to find a station, a docking station for my Velib. And Velib uh, is would... the, you know, the, the company in, in Paris. Exactly. It, it's a bike sharing uh, right. company. You, you take a bike from a docking station and you put it back. But then at times when you uh, report to work, you'll, there's always a, mo well, always a moment where you'll never find any empty space in docking stations. And that's when you 
uh, hope or that's when you wish that you had solutions like this, like the one we have in right. the form of pony bikes. So all you need to do is basically it's application driven. So this bike is, uh, you don't require a docking station. It can be parked anywhere in the city. You, you can um, find the bike. So whenever you stop and you feel like you can just leave the bike wherever you want to stop. Absolutely, and you can find a bike uh, depending on where you are through this application. So right now I'm, I'm, I found this bike. Apparently it's showing me on the street here. And the way to open it, instead of having it locked in the docking station, is to just uh, click open here, uh, scan the QR code. You wait for some time. Like four or five seconds, and uh, and it unlocks. And it, it unlocks, and then you are on your way. The only difference between this uh, these bikes and um, and Velib is that uh, you pay as you go. So in this case, you pay eighty cents. There's also another bike. Uh, this is another French bike called Indigo Wheel. So this for this you they charge fifty cents uh, for thirty minutes. In case of Velib, there's an annual uh, subscription. An annual fee. Yeah. Right. So. It's relatively cheaper, but the convenience of having these bikes, I think it balances the difference in prices. And there is, as you mentioned, there's a, there are so many- Different uh, companies yeah, exactly. flooding the market right Free now. Free floating bikes, that's how they are right. called. So right now in there's Paris- There's also a solar panel on this one, on the pony bike. Yeah, this front. solar panel is, of course, for the, for the light. Uh, you also have, this bike is slightly different because the rubber, it's, it's tubeless. And so it's made, it's hard rubber. Uh, the, this bike also compared to the normal bikes is slightly smaller. And, and very light as well. Absolutely, it's one third good. the weight of Velib. So that also helps, but of course it's for uh, shorter distances. Dan, thank you so much. We look forward to riding these bikes in Paris. That brings us to the end of this week's edition of Tech 24, but do stay with us here on France 24.